uh, what, what a wonderful introduction. It's very rare for anyone to have anything good to say about me, let alone that many good things to say about me. So thank you very much, Danielle. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to moderate the panel today. And I will first introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, first, we have Dave Bradley, my longtime friend and colleague, Chief Revenue Officer with Bitcoin Well. And we've developed a fun fact fun fact for everyone on the panel so that you can, you know, humanize us, get to know us a little bit. So Dave's fun fact is that he is the strongest and most handsome Bitcoin entrepreneur in Canada. The sheet, the sheet says that Dave believes he is, he is, but we all believe he is. Okay. That's the consensus reality is that Dave actually is because I said it today. Um, I love Dave. I can't say enough good things about him. Next, we have Alex Ciche, Business Development Manager at Memory Express and Bitcoin Marketplace. Alex has a long fun fact. He loves skiing and surfing and once broke his shoulder while surfing in Maui. Due to the trip being uh, spur of the moment, Alex forgot to purchase travel insurance and uh, his father also shattered his knee 20 years earlier. The cost for three days in hospital was over 120000 for that shattered knee, so Alex spent the week dealing with his broken shoulder rather than going to the hospital in America. I'm um, excited about the possibilities of crypto. Alex is here to help us understand where crypto fits into retail and why retail adoption in e-commerce is a wise and profitable decision. And Alex, I gotta say, I identify with that. I broke both my arms skateboarding as a teenager and immediately after getting my arms out of casts, I broke my right foot. Um, and hit it from my parents so that I would be able to continue skateboarding. <laughs> and now my right foot is made of glass. Last, we have Kanal Basin, director and co-lead crypto assets and blockchain with KPMG. His fun fact, 3.5 years ago, he was told by leaders in his first week at the firm that crypto is not here to stay and that it will be regulated out of existence. Here we are talking about how KPMG has added crypto assets to its balance sheet and taking a market leading position on that. And in absentia, the empty chair on the end, we have the esteemed, the illustrious Matthew Bitcoin Burgoyne, partner in McLeod Law. Matthew is always with us in spirit, if not in body. And his fun fact, just because I love him and he's not here, he loves to read horror fiction and watch horror movies. I mean, who doesn't? And he's an avid runner, having completed several marathons. So get well soon, Matthew. We love you, brother. Um, so. I'll read the introduction and then I'll shut up and let the experts talk. Uh, growing corporate adoption of Bitcoin means new regulatory and financial considerations for industries like finance and retail and unique opportunities for growth in one of the world's fastest evolving markets. Discover the latest in thought leadership on the economic rationale for holding Bitcoin on the corporate balance sheet, regulatory implications, and how industries can benefit from building services that support Bitcoin payments and investments. I will talk much less from here on out and we'll open it to our esteemed panel. Um, you guys can go in whatever order you want to go in. I, I trust I'll you to self-regulate yourselves. Um, 2021 was a year of unprecedented mainstream adoption for Bitcoin by major institutions and investors. From your perspective, what's behind this massive shift? Uh, the price. That's pretty much it. The, Fact is that uh, probably half the people in this room wouldn't be here if Bitcoin had been at three thousand bucks. <clears throat> excuse me for the last six years, and so the price drives a lot of excitement in the space. And a lot of people are kind of hesitant to admit that the price and all that excitement is what brings them in. But it's not actually a bad thing, I don't think, because the price is a function of what's actually being accomplished when companies put Bitcoin on the balance sheet, and that is a hedge against inflation, a hedge against all this insane money printing that we're seeing and unlimited government spending, and really just taking control of your own spending power. And that's something that people have been doing individually for a long time, and now it's, it's almost becoming a necessity, and it soon will become even more of a necessity for companies to do that. Unlike Dave was mentioning, uh, I'm starting to see that a lot as well out there uh, as you know our companies get involved in it. But the the adoption rates increased quite a bit. There's more regulation out there. There's more, more businesses are willing to adopt um, this type of technology just because people are using it. 
um, a lot of retail industries that are picking it up, whether they accept it themselves or using another tool in order to be able to accept it where they don't actually have to deal with the Bitcoin. Uh, they're seeing much more customer adoption. 40% uh, of customers that they didn't have before are starting to come to them just because they have, uh, it's a new type of technology, a new tool, and they're actually spending a lot more than people that would normally use a credit card or something like that. In some cases, double. So we're probably going to see quite a bit of that moving forward in the future. The volatility has become less. Institutions are investing in it far more than they were before. Uh, and big institutions, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, you name it, they've, they've dumped tens of billions into crypto this year and last year. And I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. It's finally kind of past the honeymoon phase. And I think people are really starting to look at this seriously. And like Dave mentioned, that's why a lot of people are here. I think it's something we're going to see happening much more frequently in the future. And the adoption rates increasing very quickly. This, this is only the beginning. Uh, everybody thinks it's, they've heard about Bitcoin. It's been around for 10, 12 years now. It's, it's too late. Maybe they missed the boat and that's not the case at all. I, I see it uh, becoming much more used in the future. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with all of that. I, I would say, you know, with crypto, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think it started with retail adoption at first. So that's, that's quite different from, what, from the other asset classes in the past, right? Like primarily all the retail investors were, were invested in crypto and now we're seeing a lot more institutional adoptions and, and that's primarily because of regulatory clarity. Again, the price is, is going to be a big factor. Obviously, everyone wants to get in and, and not miss the boat if they haven't already. Um, but yeah, I think you know the, the Bitcoin narrative changes quite often with, with the other macroeconomic factors. And I would say in the, in the Ethereum and other layer ones, there's so much innovation happening where a lot of very smart people and individuals are coming together and, and solving very complex challenges that are generating returns and yields for retailers, retails, and, and institutions as well. So um, we still lack a lot more regulatory clarity, especially in the DeFi space. But I feel like once we start to get more and more and more institutions comfortable with, with <coughs> using DeFi, we're going to see the adoption go, go nuts, pretty much. Right, and I, I think it's actually useful, and it's a great segue to the next question, to really define like what is adoption? Is it accepting Bitcoin as payment? Is it purchasing Bitcoin as a corporate investment or personal investment? Like, what does adoption actually mean? Because without, you know, revealing the gray in my beard, I can say that I can remember when Bitcoin was a bit of a sideshow and there were stupid applications. Like, you could tweet someone some Bitcoin and it was like, oh, this is really cool. We're going to do this. And this is what Bitcoin is. We're tweeting each other Bitcoin, which, without expressing too much personal opinion, that use case was stupid. Um, what are some of the top use cases for corporate holdings of Bitcoin in terms of consumer services and investments? And what do you think will drive adoption? And I'll just kind of step on you guys for a minute by listing like e-commerce, investment, inflation hedge, uh, you know, realizing what Ripple came after and tried to do with replacing Swift, which one of Dave's, one of my favorite things that Dave ever says is, why don't you use Bitcoin for that? Um, so, I mean, I'll pass it to the panel, but I, th I think we could all grow old listing the use cases for Bitcoin. Yeah, th like, I think there's a lot of use cases potentially for Bitcoin, but the number one thing, the number one reason why people buy it, the number one reason why a company might want it on its balance sheet is that hedge against inflation. It's, it's an investment, it's a form of money that will not be depreciated by the state. That's essentially what we're talking about when we want to hold Bitcoin. And all these other things like the e-commerce and stuff like that, there's some cool stuff in there. There's some niche use cases. I don't think in most cases it's going to be better than like using PayPal or using your Visa or something like that from a user experience. But it will allow companies to tap in to a new user base of people who are saving in Bitcoin and sometimes want to spend that. So it can be a useful tool as customer acquisition on that side. But on the flip side, I think it's actually having the opposite effect in a lot of cases where a company starts accepting Bitcoin uh, because they're hoping to get new customers out of it. And then the result is they start holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet that they've, they've gotten from their customers. And then once they start to see, like, the, you know, the, there's all kinds of uh, buzzwords and DeFi technology and three-layer acronyms that essentially mean nothing in this space except for the one three-layer acronym of NGU technology, number go up technology. And that's what Bitcoin does, is Bitcoin's permanently scarce 
And in relation to the dollar in the long term, it's always gone up. And once companies start to see that, they've got some on their balance sheet and you know, you know, maybe they've accepted it from some customers, uh, that opens some eyes, it opens some doors. And I, I think that's kind of a, like a Trojan horse to get Bitcoin into companies in some cases. And I agree with you 100% here, Dave. Uh, one of the big things that we're seeing, everybody's seeing with inflation is the problem with governments and our currency and, and how they're printing too much of it. And it's when you start getting into the real technicalities of it, our currency isn't money. It doesn't have a store of value. Bitcoin does. There's a finite amount of it. Whenever somebody loses their key, loses their wallet or something, there's even less of it. So if anything, you get the opposite effect of inflation. Now, we, we've had to overcome some, some issues ourselves, my own business and, and others out there where it comes to volatility. Uh, a lot of businesses get worried about things like that. But when you look at uh, what it offers you, what it prevents, um, we don't have to deal with chargebacks. The frauds and things are not nearly as bad. Transactions are completed anywhere in the world, just like we were talking about with Swift. Even Swift is starting to take a bit of a blow right now where you got the BRICS system starting up in place of it and uh, governments looking at how the US has weaponized their dollar in the recent months and stuff also doesn't provide a lot of confidence in it. Uh, so, and there's many, many new ways that companies are able to adopt Bitcoin now and use it uh, for e-commerce where they're not as, in, 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 they're not as in a difficult position as they were before because there's multiple ways now to get involved with it. You don't actually have to hold the Bitcoin if you don't want to. You don't actually even have to touch the Bitcoin if you don't want to. You can use third party companies out there like BitK BitPay, Bitcoin Well, companies that are willing to do the exchange for you. Um, like my, my uh, distributors and things won't accept Bitcoin as payment, so I need to pay them in cash. But that can be done very easily now for any company that wants to do it. There's multiple, multiple organizations out there that are trying to encourage this and help it, which is what's increasing the adoption rate of Bitcoin. Uh, cryptocurrencies, I think the biggest difficulty that everybody was having at the beginning was just figuring out how to get into it, how to understand it. It seems extremely complicated. It, it, it scares them. Seeing all these new innovations happening because of all the new regulatory systems and things that are becoming in place and the amount of the the advantages that it's provided to companies, like I mentioned, no chargebacks, no fraud. When, I, when that Bitcoin transaction comes through, it's in my hand, it's like cash. You can't just turn around and say, oh, I changed my mind, don't pay them. It's too late, I have it. Then it's up to me to whether we return it or not. So you have much more control over it. At the same time, more control means you know, you've got more responsibility, more power. You don't have anybody to go to if something goes wrong. You can't call up your bank and say, hey, I accidentally sent this to the wrong person. It's too bad. Uh, but but at the same time, it gives you a lot more control and power over what you're doing. Things are done quicker, things happen faster. You can, you can move forward much more quickly with it than when you're trying to introduce new technologies with credit cards and things like that. And the younger generation is adopting this extremely quickly. And the more innovation we see and the more apps that are allowing people to get involved with it easier and use it easier, the more we're gonna see it in, increase over the next little while. So, Getting your business or e-commerce or anything involved with it right now is uh, it's probably a good idea. And it's you're still early. You haven't missed the boat yet. It's still a good time. Yep, absolutely agree. And I think you know different companies are are adopting crypto for different reasons. Um, for us at KPMG, the reason why we invested in crypto as as part of our treasury was, and it, we really wanted to put our skin in the game. Right? We're a professional services company. For us, uh, I remember over three years ago, I went to eat Denver, and uh, people were there were asking me, what's KPMG doing here? Right? And, and it was a fair question. Like The community didn't really chai with, with the likes of KPMG or any other accounting firm because that's what Bitcoin kind of you know, decentralizes. So for us, it was a different reason. We wanted to put skin in the game. It wasn't an investment opportunity for us. It was, it was quite different. Uh, but if you look at some of the other industries and some of the other companies that we're working with now, it, it is primarily they want to accept crypto as payments, whether that be stable coins, whether that be Bitcoin, or whether that be Ethereum or, or others. Uh, and now you have payment processors that are allowing them to do that in a very seamless fashion. Uh, we, we're working with charities that are looking to accept crypto donations. We, we know that's a, that's a significant use case as well. Um, and obviously, you know, for the institutional investors, it's looking into not just you know Bitcoin, but also uh, with, with the advent of Bitcoin ETFs and other crypto ETFs, 
you know, in institutional investors and even retail investors are able to get in to the space and leveraging their TFSAs and RSPs. So I think a lot of people are, are engaging with the space for, for different reasons. Um, and yeah, one of the reasons why I, I believe we're going to see a lot more adoption in, in the coming months and, and years is because the likes of companies like Visa, Mastercard, when you think of all the banks that are engaging with the space, when you think of a lot of these financial services that are now in, engaging with crypto asset services and, and providing those services to their clients, we're seeing a lot more maturity in the space now. Like we're, we're past the phase where people wanted to understand the basics of Bitcoin, how does the technology, how does the, how does the architecture work? No, we don't know how internet works, we don't know the background of HTTPS, we just use it in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that's the space where we are in now with, with Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and some of, some of the other crypto assets. There's more innovation happening where there's a lot more education required, but primarily for, for these Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think we're, we're, at, we're past that point where everyone needs to understand what is under the hood. Uh, we're, we're past that. And uh, I, think, I think we missed two really relevant use cases, so I'm just gonna take a little moderator license and open like a sub question for you guys. So number one, one of the top ways that I use crypto every day is as a medium of exchange, as a remittance vehicle for international finance, international payments. Um, I joked on the weekend, I was in North Carolina with an agency that Phantom Compliance partners with, and it was like, ah, just hang on, we can't go to the shooting range yet because I have to send two payments. And I just, it took me 10 minutes. What would take me four and a half hours here at the bank in my neighborhood because I'd have to go there and take the contract with my vendor or with my client. I would have to take the invoice for the services and keep in mind I've had this bank account for 14 years, by the way. So it's not like they don't know me. It's not like this isn't a seasoned bank account, but I think, um, and it's not that you guys are dummies or anything, but we just didn't, we just missed remittance, you know? And I, I feel like crypto is really disrupting that. And I feel like the tentacles of TradFi are really closing around SWIFT and really, I mean, I've, I've banked with Scotiabank. If anybody out there is from Scotiabank, by the way, I love Scotiabank. Um, I've banked with Scotiabank since I was five years old. I had a getting there account, and yet I still need to take all this stuff just to go pay Thomson Reuters for my sanction screening software. So um, I know that, you know, you two gentlemen on the end, you come from, you know, you probably don't have trouble sending bank wires, but I mean, I'd, I'd like to kind of explore some of these more, not necessarily edge use cases, but um, I mean, also we got to fill an hour here, guys. We, <laughs> we all agree with each other and we all have punchy answers, but you know, let's give the people what they want. So I'd like to just kind of talk about ways that um, crypto is disrupting TradFi use cases, specifically in remittance consumer payments, and uh, this isn't on the sheet, by the way, so sorry, CBC, I'm just going nuts. Um, I'd also like to talk about like achieving the like competitive latency with Visa MasterCard, right? Because of course that's a challenge, the amount of time it takes a block to resolve, double spend vulnerabilities, these kind of things. So I'm gonna go from two to two A and bat that back to you guys for remittance and consumer payments. Please okay. go ahead. Um, I also love all the banks, in case there's any <laughs> banks here who want to give me a bank we account. We all love banks. Um, we all do. That, that's amazing. Um, no, but so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of niche use cases, and Bitcoin ends up filling the gap where um, traditional finance falls down in the payment rails in one way or another. A really cool story from years ago um, when I had a Bitcoin store and we had this uh, whole high school class came in and they all had to buy 500 bucks worth of Bitcoin because they were taking a class trip to Mexico and the tour operator in Mexico normally was taking uh, deposits by credit card and then you know lines up all the expenses for this tour and whatnot and then uh, kids decide they don't want to go, uh, parents cancel and they just charge it back. And this little tour operator was in no position to argue with Visa and so he just eats it. And so he decided he was getting so much charge back uh, volume that he would only take Bitcoin for deposits. And so that's an area where like <clears throat> our existing payment rails were failing and they, this guy like just found a solution with Bitcoin and the result was all these kids are probably, they're probably all rich now because they'll probably all 
got into Bitcoin in like 2014 because of this tour operator. And uh, so, so that's awesome. But uh, I think it fills all these little gaps like that. I think on the flip side though, a lot of the inefficiencies in our current payment system are there deliberately. Like there's no reason that we couldn't have doubt. zero day settlement to Asia. Like database technology exists that could do this. And it's just, it's not in the bank's best interest to settle things quickly. And I think that in the short term, Bitcoin is pushing that settlement technology faster, but I don't think that's going to be how it's used in the very long term because the banks can just flip a switch and start competing with Bitcoin as a settlement tool in the short term. And like you mentioned with Visa, like Bitcoin is never going to compete with like tap and pay and that kind of stuff. It's the areas where the traditional financial institutions have been incentivized for efficiency they're doing a great job of serving us with payments. And Bitcoin is not as good as that for short-term payments. There's no reason that you need this like massive, secure, decentralized payment network to pay for your coffee, right? It's completely pointless. What you need is you need the certainty that this, this currency that you're sitting on is not gonna be devalued. And so I don't really think it's about payments, even though it gets used in a lot of really cool niche cases for payments right now, I think that those like those kids, the high school kids, if they're still in Bitcoin, what's benefited them the most is not that they could go on that tour, it's that they had that exposure to that number go up technology to the, the hedge against inflation. So that's the long-term thing I keep going back to. Everything else just leads to that. I, I'm just gonna step, I'm gonna step on you for a minute, Alex, if that's okay. So years ago, I mean, I've, I've been in Bitcoin for a really long time. But years ago, we were with a client that did a pilot with Visa Europe that was like, how can blockchain improve the way we're doing settlements between issuing and acquiring banks in the Euro acquiring zone? And it was like, okay, the first 20 pages of our report said, let's say Dave is an issuing bank and I'm an acquiring bank. And we owe each other money every day. So Dave owes me $3 and I owe Dave $5. So rather than me just sending Dave $2, Dave sends me three and I send five. So the first 20 pages of our report were eliminate all these garbage churn transactions so that we can identify what we're really making more efficient. And every bank that participated in our pilot was like, this is our entire fee base, you idiots. This churn is how we make money and we're not eliminating it. So it was a useful exercise, but I mean, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think these settlement problems really exist. And I think they are a revenue source for TradFi gatekeepers, Alex. Uh, I agree. They, they are. Uh, this, this with these institutions, part of how they make money as part of their business. Um, and I agree with Dave as well, where Bitcoin is more right now something that you're storing your value in, something that you're, you're using to hold on to whatever you're, it's a digital asset. You're trying to hang on to your cash. If, if inflation is going up at 12 to 20 percent, who knows what it really is right now. Uh, if you're not earning at least that much in interest on your money, you're technically your purchasing power has gone down each year. You're losing, you're losing the ability to buy things. Um, so the youngsters and stuff that are getting involved in that, that's, that's great. Uh, as for payment settlements and things, you're right. Um, Bitcoin is not as efficient. I think it, you can settle something along the lines of 10 to 12 transactions a second, where Visa in some cases around Christmas is doing 80 to 90,000 transactions a second. Um, there is technology that's catching up to that and helping with it. But again, like the SWIFT networks and things where you're trying to settle things over a five, six day period around the world, Bitcoin is Bitcoin anywhere in the world. Whether you're in China, whether you're in Russia, whether you're in, in Europe, uh, it, it doesn't really make much of a difference. You, you can move your wealth around. That's something that I know a lot of countries are not a huge fans of. Uh, <laughs> but, but it gives you a lot of flexibility in that regard. Um, for, for payment systems, it's good in some ways too. I mean, in, in, a, in a retail level, when you look at payments from Visa and MasterCards, most consumers don't see this, but they're, you don't get reimbursed fully for the amount of whatever the product is. If you sell something for $10,000, um, Visa or MasterCard is going to take two and a half, three percent 3% on something along those lines. Interchange. Um, that's right. Uh, so as part of the fee, the, uh, from the consumer standpoint, you don't see that, but from a business as a merchant, you do. And the small transaction fees that are on Bitcoin, which is very tiny. I was doing transactions last week at you know, 76 cents a transaction and confirmations are taking place in less than 10 minutes. Um, in, in those regards, it, 
it is actually more beneficial for the business. We don't take that hit of three, four hundred dollars on a ten thousand dollar item. Uh, it, it's it's much less. The the security is there. There's no chargebacks on these things. There's less fraud. I mean, wherever that person's sending the Bitcoin from, it doesn't really matter. Once I have it, once it's confirmed and it's in the account, it's there. I don't have to worry about something going wrong down the road. It's it's now ours. It's in our possession. And how we handle it, what we do with it, how we refund it or whatever is completely up to us and completely within our control. So there, there is some benefits to using it as a payment system. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that as new layers and new technologies. Some people have probably heard of like Lightning Network and things. Don't hit me, Dave. <laughs> For, but, but new technologies and layers and things that are coming up on top of these things that are going to aid in that process. I don't think it's going to be a limiting factor for much longer. Um, uh, it's banks and institutions are always, I think, going to have a place. Um, but the youngsters out there who I'm seeing, customers of ours and people that I've talked to in all these groups and organizations that I go to, um, they're really getting into this. They they have more control over their money. They feel they don't have to go in and make an appointment and talk with somebody about investing. There's there's pools and things that they can put their Bitcoin and, and other tokens and things. And they're not using it and get interest within 12 days, 15 days. They're seeing that they're, they're earning it through mining on their own computers at home. They have a lot more control. There's a lot more flexibility with it. And they don't have to necessarily set up appointments and deal with people and everything to get it done. And, and that's really appealing to the young generation. And it's even appealing on a business standpoint, as you mentioned that we're, a lot of companies, I have to pay my, my distributors and things in real cash, fiat currency, but at the same time, I'd like to keep the Bitcoin on the balance sheet because over time, it's going to keep going up. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's giving us a lot of flexibility in how we do business, too. So, Yeah, I think that last point that you mentioned, Alex, around not a lot of people want to you know, send their Bitcoin or use their Bitcoin for remittance, right? So the way we've looked at it and, and the way I personally look at it is... Bitcoin is, is serving the narrative of a store of value, right? Um, I don't want to transact with my Bitcoin that much, right? I want to hold it, the number go up. So, so definitely want to keep that in there. But if you think about how crypto assets, and, and when I say crypto asset, it involves like Bitcoin, Ethereum, stable coins, other layer ones, and, and other assets. Stable coins are definitely serving, you know, that serving the need of the, the remittance. Um, we're, I've talked to so many institutions that have businesses worldwide and they want to transfer you know, money to, to each other like inter-country and they want to use stable coins because they don't want to deal with the volatility of crypto, whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum or anything else, but they want to still have a, you know, a stable medium of exchange that will be recognized wherever they're sending it to. Um, and, and that's where I think there's going to be a lot more innovation. We can go all day talk about whether stable coins are they impacting the financial stability or are they just you know putting in a more efficient mechanism of, of remittance um, so I do believe that there you know in the coming years we will see a lot more adoption of stable coins for the purpose of remittance um, whether that be you know just for within the company or whether you're making a payment to another company which is outside of your jurisdiction outside of the country and, and stable coins whether that's USDC at Canadian dollar stable coin, um, we're going to see a lot more adoption of that. We're already seeing that. And, and the example that um, Alex gave around the visa taking 2.53% of, of that, that, that's peanuts uh, when it comes to stable coins, right? Like stable coins do not charge that much fee for a transaction. And, and it doesn't matter what the amount is. What matters is how many transactions you're sending. And, and that's what's key for, for most organizations. Wonderful answers, guys. Uh, thank you for entertaining my sub-question. Number three, how concerned should corporations be about the changing cryptocurrency regulatory landscape when holding Bitcoin, and what are the key laws impacting crypto holdings and transactions? And also, I'm the only guy on the stage that owns his own compliance firm, so you'd think this question is a natural for me. But I'm going to let these guys go first and then tell them everything they missed, just like the last question. Um, um, I feel, as someone who's dealt with regulations in Canada for a while, I feel pretty secure about where they sit. I'm not particularly worried about like a sudden change for the worse. Um, 
that's not necessarily true everywhere in the world. There's very um, terrifying regulations coming through in the EU that uh, potentially could ban self-custodied wallets, which takes away a lot of the benefits of Bitcoin and I think would have almost the effect of banning Bitcoin. So like we're not, we were, we were actively looking as a company at expanding into the EU and the very fact that they're looking at those regulations means we are not considering that anymore. So that's a, a cautionary tale for the government people in the room is like the uh, amount of regulation that you need to drive away foreign business investment is very small. So I think, uh, you know, everyone in the industry is still cautious. We've seen so many times that, uh, that governments have, have made a small misstep that has driven uh, innovation from one sector or another out of a country. And uh, that's always possible. I don't think it's going to happen here. We're seeing really good, um, you know, positive movement from both our, our local provincial governments and then some, some federal candidates and whatnot being openly pro-Bitcoin. And I think that there, there's a window right now, actually, wherein the first jurisdiction in the world to go very, very heavily into what exactly we're talking about here, Bitcoin on the balance sheet, um, you know, may, may end up as the richest jurisdiction in the world permanently if they're the first ones to jump. And we're seeing a little bit of uh, holdings from some countries like El Salvador and Bulgaria has a little bit of Bitcoins, but um, that would be a powerful signal as well. If we saw the government of Canada or the government of Alberta take the move to hold Bitcoins, it would not only uh, have a massive positive impact for the long-term financial health of that jurisdiction, it would be a, a powerful signal to any businesses looking to incorporate in that area that they don't in fact have to worry at all about the regulatory impact of holding Bitcoins. The only problem is, is if the government of Alberta bought Bitcoin, the bank would close their bank accounts. So where, where would the taxes go? Uh, uh, this is an area I'm not as much of an expert in as you, but uh, it, yeah, it's something to be a little bit concerned with, something to pay attention to. Um, over the last couple of years, I've seen the financial institutions and stuff open up a little bit more to to Bitcoin and, and crypto than they were before. And two, three years ago, if you had crypto or Bitcoin even in your company name, you couldn't open a bank account at most banks. They just wouldn't do it uh, for business or anything. Uh, now we're seeing that being relaxed a little bit more. And going back to the first question, the adoption from institutions and things now starting to put investments into it. Big banks like Morgan Stanley, big investment firms, big hedge funds, big mutual funds, countries that are starting to look into it. Sure, there's some that are banning it and stuff where you've seen China banning the mining of it and whatnot. Um, but, you know, with innovation and things, there's always challenges. And you always see true entrepreneurs and people that are trying to succeed with these things, find ways around it, find ways to push it through. And I think we're starting to see that shift this past last year and during the pandemic and everything where it's, it's not, they're not as fearful of it anymore. I think they're looking at it that they're not going to be able to necessarily avoid it. So may as well take part in it and have some control in it, which gives you the best of both worlds. I mean, if you're in one of those industries like banking or something, you wouldn't want to stay completely out of it if you start seeing something like this succeeding as well as it is in government as well if you if you completely outright ban it so if you're just going to push it underground people are going to keep using it. It, it, it it's not a solution it's kind of like the war on drugs or something right i mean you can spend 20 years fighting bitcoin but you, just like we saw with the protests already have spent the 20 years fighting bitcoin i think yeah, yeah well you know the government tried to regulate and stop the donations and things for instance the truckers wherever you stand on that it doesn't really matter the idea is that you know they, they couldn't it it you can say whatever you want, but at the end of the day, it was getting done and, and they didn't really have the control over it that they hoped they did. Um, so, so it's a fine line and, and even the governments have to be careful as to how hard they push back to it. And really, I think we're not seeing a pushback anymore. We're seeing how do they comply with it? How do they work with it? How do they, how do they take some control of it? How do they adopt some of it and become part of this? And then they have some influence over it. Um, and, and that's happening with everyone. We mentioned Morgan Stanley and BlackRock and some of the biggest investment firms in the world. And I think that's what we're going to see happening moving forward. It's still something to be cautious about and, and you know, to be careful when you're investing or what you're putting, putting things into and how you're moving your business. But, but I feel, and this is a personal opinion now, that, that we're getting to that point where I think most now are going to work with it instead of against it. And, and that's going to work out probably better for everybody. 
Yeah, the way I look at regulation, it, it's primarily when we look at it from two lenses, right? Like the investors and, and the services. So from an investor standpoint, there is, we've gotten a lot more clarity than on the services side. Like we've seen our guidances from IROC, OSC, CSA, everyone has come out with when they actually consider it to be like securities law will be applicable to the, to this crypto asset or not. And in, in situations in which they will be considered securities and, and not. Um, whereas in the financial services space, if we look at OSPI, uh, I mean, anyone from OSPI, like I, I still would want to catch up and see what we can do, but uh, there has been zero clarity from OSPI on, on the financial services end. They haven't really come out and said whether banks can participate in, in custody and crypto like OCC in the US has, right? In the US, it's, it's pretty much opposite where they don't have that much clarity on the investor side because Again, ETF is a, is a really long story and it's gonna be a long story in the US, but in Canada, we're, we're definitely well positioned with the clarity that we have in the ETF space with the advent of, you know, with the introduction of crypto ETFs that we have here. A lot more money is flowing into Canada because of those ETFs, because of, you know, regulators being open to, to innovation, creating a sandbox environment for these innovative companies to come in and, and experiment and, and really, you know, taking part in that experiment. Most of us, everyone that's here in the crypto space, we want to do the right thing at the end of the day, right? And it's just, we need to have some clarity around where, where the line is, about where we're not, where we shouldn't cross the line to go into some gray area where it's, it's beyond legal. Uh, and I think that's what, that's the clarity that we we're looking to get. And um, I mean, even if you think about the AML regulations and, and Ryan, you can talk about it all day, um, but you know we have clarity from FATF. They have put out guidances on when they when institutions need to report on on the suspicious transactions. How do they need to report it? Um, and in some other jurisdictions, those requirements are are pretty much more stringent than than what we have here in Canada, which is again hampering innovation and hampering adoption. So. I would say um, from a regulatory lens, we, we definitely need a lot more clarity on the financial services side, uh, whereas on the investor side, we, we do have that. Sure, and I, I won't shill for my company, but by the way, Phantom Compliance, everybody. Uh, but listen, we're talking about companies buying Bitcoin with their own money on this, right? We're not talking about accepting consumer payments. We're not taking, talking about taking custody of funds and investing on consumer behalf. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about people using their own money to purchase crypto assets and hold them, which thank God that's not that heavily regulated. You can, you can still do what you want with your own money in Canada, which is amazing. And I want to be careful that we don't bleed over the line into consumer funds, custody, securities law, etc. which by the way, if you want to talk to me about it, you will get very bored because I can talk about it for hours and hours and hours. But I just wanted to kind of parse that regulation, we're talking about people using their own money to purchase things for their own benefit here. We're not talking about people accepting consumer payments and providing consumer services. So that would be an entire other panel. It would be a term that I cringe at a whole nother topic. Um, so we only have two questions left and probably about 10 minutes left, guys. So I'm going to have to hit the gas now as your moderator. So number five is predictions. So we'll make that three to five sentences each. And number four, let's really dig in on cybersecurity threats. Um, crypto is a major target for breaches. Also, Dave, I missed it. You told me to call for a provincial regulator. I really think Alberta would benefit from a provincial regulator that was able to call shots and work with provincially licensed FIs and you know make this thing a little utopia in Canada. But uh, that's another topic as well. Um, what best practices can companies use to protect their Bitcoin? And I'm unfortunately going to have to take two minutes after you guys are done with this one because I have a lot of relevant examples here. So, so the first one is kind of a double-edged sword, I would say. Uh, what we say all the time in the Bitcoin industry is not your keys, not your coins. Uh, some people have learned that the hard way. Um, not everybody wants to self-custody their coins. But be very careful who you trust your coins with if you're going to self-custody your coins. It is something that you can learn to do. Um, as a company, it's a little bit trickier. You want to make sure that like your controller doesn't suddenly disappear because Bitcoin went up and now he's on a beach in a non-extradition country. 
Um, so you, you need to have some controls around like who can access the coins, when and why. You want to have policies about uh, you know when they should be moved, when they should be sold, and all that kind of ties into a, just a big picture look on what your goal is with the Bitcoins. And so Bitcoins are not really a great tool for saving money that you need to spend soon. Because they're very volatile, um, but there's never been a time when you couldn't buy Bitcoin and wait five years and be massively up. So they're a long-term savings tool and they should be treated as such uh, with regards to, to how you control them. And if you control them um, you know, in, in sort of best practices way, ways with a hardware wallet and uh, good documentation and control over who has the backups, there isn't really like a cybersecurity risk. There's not like somebody's gonna hack that and be able to, to get away with it. Where the cybersecurity stuff comes in is when you have sort of irresponsible practices, whether you're holding your coins in a phone or or in a computer connected to the internet, and um, then they can get stolen. And usually that's just a, a very expensive way to learn not to do that. Pretty silly. You only learn that lesson once. Yeah. I Hopefully. <laughs> I agree with you, Dave. There's a, there was a lot of thought that went into it when my business started getting involved with Memory Express and Bitcoin Marketplace and how we were going to manage that and what we were going to do and how secure would it be. And, and Bitcoin is very much like cash in, in a way. You, you, you have to be careful. You have to be responsible with it. You have to know where you're putting it, what your plan is, what you're going to do with it. Um, the security issues, like they said, I, I don't think is, is a big issue with being hacked or anything along those lines. It was really refreshing and amazing to see how many options were out there for how you can secure your Bitcoin. Um, most of the, the big issues that we've seen in the last few years, like Quadriga and, and Mal Gox and things like that, those were exchanges and things where people, again, you weren't in, who's the custodian of your Bitcoin? If you're leaving it on an exchange, it's not in your wallet, it's in someone else's hands. And who you can trust in those regards. I mean, some of these companies were pretty big that walked away with people's Bitcoin. However, being in a hardware wallet instead of your phone, there's multiple options out there these days to ensure the security where you can have um, multiple hardware wallets tied into one where you need two people out of out of three to sign off on, on removing Bitcoin from the wallet. Um, so for, from a business standpoint, there's a lot of options to where you can ensure that that Bitcoin is safe, it's secure, and the only way to access it is between your CEO and a lawyer or the CEO and the CFO. Um, they both have to sign off on being able to withdraw money from that wallet, and because it's in your own custody and not on an exchange or something, you don't really have to worry too much about somebody taking it. However, with the volatility and everything else, it's good to have a plan. Holding on to it for long term has shown since the beginning of Bitcoin that if you hold it, it's gonna go up in value over time. Uh, it, it's not something like you mentioned that you want to be moving quickly if you need to spend it fast. Uh, it's more an investment in that regard from, from a company standpoint, keeping it on the balance books. Um, but I think that's becoming more and more clear. There's many more options of how to do it. And there's many options for businesses moving forward on, on how to ensure the safety of it and how the accounting can deal with it. And, and I think moving forward, that's not going to be as much of an issue as it was at the beginning. I'm quite surprised at how many new technologies and ways there are to ensure that you keep your Bitcoin safe. And, uh, but having a plan and a strategy in place and understanding what you want to do with it from, from a company standpoint is very important. If you don't do it right, you could end up losing quite a bit. So. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think when it comes to like the, some of the and custody is the biggest risk when it comes to crypto, whether that's for, for retail or, or institutional folks. Um, for retail, it's it's a little bit easier because they want to, you know, manage their own keys. You can get hardware wallets as long as you you know that when you're putting your crypto on an exchange, then then you're really not owning your own crypto. So having that understanding, understanding the risks that come with owning your own crypto by by using a ledger or a hardware wallet. Um, and, and how to manage that, how to recover if you lose the hardware wallet. So all of those things are, are things that a retailer should know about. And don't click on any links that you don't know where the, where the source is from. So phishing is one of the primary you know, concerns when it comes to retail because people click on email links without knowing what, what, what's out there. Uh, and that's why a lot of people are losing out on their crypto. Um, for institutions, just knowing who you're dealing with, understanding you know who's a qualified custodian, what what sort of custody operations do they have, what are their key lifecycle management practices, 
uh, starting from like key generation to key storage, key, key destruction and, and key recovery, you need to have a good understanding of all of that. You need to know who you're dealing with um, and just making sure that the practices that your custodian is taking is, um, is secure enough for your own standards. Um, if you think about banks, they've been in the business of custodying keys um, for the longest time. Like any transaction that happens with a bank with Visa or MasterCard, they're all using keys that are stored in vaults somewhere underground. So um, just having an understanding and, and recognizing that the custody of digital assets is different from your traditional assets and understanding the risks, understanding how you can manage those risks is going to be key. And, and you know, cyber, um, again, it's, it's a threat, but I don't think it's a threat uh, as much as it was, let's say, four years ago because of the innovation and, and the improvement in the usability that we have seen is, is out of this world. And, and I think it's just going to continue to improve. Okay, so I'm going to give like one brief thought on that. We're going to go to five sentences each of predictions for 2022, but then we're going to go to questions. So one of the common threads that I feel like I heard through your recommendations about cybersecurity guys was common sense. And I feel like in crypto, there's like a trend and history of applying kind of analogous legislation. So like, oh, it looks like an MSP. So we're going to make everybody be an MSP. It looks like an exempt market dealer. So we're going to make everybody be an exempt market dealer. And I feel like the next logical step is to be like, well, let's require all these crypto outfits to do ongoing penetration testing. Let's require them to document what they do with devices when they fire someone, how they, you know, and I see you nodding because I know you're on my page, my man, because this is kind of the next wave in maturity is all of us are actually going to have to clear these audits. We're all going to have to prove that we're keeping things secure and like Bitcoin is very secure. I'm not concerned about Bitcoin at all. I'm concerned about all the roads into Bitcoin. So when we're defining an asset and we're defining access points to that asset, we need to be reasonable about it. I mean, you don't leave the gate open and then wonder why the hell your dog's running in the street. I'm, you know, and so, some of these things, the horse is already out of the barn and we're all feverishly trying to get him back in there. But um, it's an exciting time. It's a rad time in Bitcoin. And... You know, that's me pontificating. So guys, five sentences, predictions, max of five, I'm counting. Predictions for 2022, how will the corporate crypto market evolve? Well, I think, uh, uh, that's one, I don't need any. Um, all of the smartest companies in the world will buy Bitcoin. Here, here. Alex. All five. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, I think with instability, inflation, people being unsure of where things are going, the loss of the value in their, their money and their investments, I think people are going to move towards more assets that are a store value, that are true money. And you're going to see that with property and you're going to see that with digital property and crypto and Bitcoin is a digital asset. It's, it's a digital property that you want. We're going to see the smart companies investing more in it. And I think you're going to see many individuals investing more in it in 2022. That, that's a guarantee. That was like 11, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say um, one. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of companies that, will, that have already bought Bitcoin um, will start to use their Bitcoin, put their Bitcoin to use for, for some of the other reasons. There's going to be a lot more uh, usability in terms of collateralized Bitcoin backed loans um, or even like we're, we're seeing, you know, the incorporation of Bitcoin banks uh, even here in Canada. And the other prediction that I'll say is institutional DeFi. Um, that's one thing that I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not a very popular opinion, but, but that's one thing that I, I am very excited about when we think about DeFi use and, and institutions coming in, they do need to meet some requirements um, and we are seeing innovation in that space where institutions will be able to take part in it. Amazing. So we will open to questions now. I think we're, shoot, four minutes over where we should have been on questions, but big deal. Before we start questions, I want to ask a question. Um, how many people in the audience, by a show of hands, 
work for or own a company that currently holds Bitcoin on the balance sheet? Okay, now we'll go to ideas. I'm going to ask that again next year. All right, I got a question. Oh. So the first question that I've got, actually the only question that I've got, um, where do you see um, owning Bitcoin for the role of loss prevention in terms of ransomware attacks? So you've just really spoken to holding it, but there are some proactive use cases for owning it. I wonder if you've got some opinions there. Yeah, it might help. Um, there's kind of two ways to deal with ransomware. You can either go to a, a restore if you have good backups, or you can just pay the ransom. And what I always advise is for companies, if you're going to pay the ransom, pay it as fast as you can. Because the longer your business is down, the more costly the whole thing will be on top of the ransom. So certainly having some on hand might be um, an option. But what we're starting to see also is that uh, IT companies and uh, insurance companies that deal with ransomware, a lot of the time are starting to hold Bitcoins so that they can be the ones to pay very quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it certainly would be the fastest possible way to, to pay for that if you need to. Um, it also, you know, is probably a bad idea to let it be known that your company is sitting there ready to pay ransoms. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll jump over top of Dave's thing too. As a guy that manages compliance for lots of retail crypto outfits in Canada, if if somebody approaches us and is like, "Oh my God, I need to pay this ransom," we're like, "See you later, bro. Like, we don't want anything to do with your distressed, urgent stuff over here." And the reason being, like, I might be showing my age in Bitcoin, but if anybody remembers CoinMX. One of the key things that happened in their federal indictment, it wasn't the money laundering, it wasn't the bank fraud, it wasn't the bribery. It was that they coached their operators through how to help people pay ransomware. So they were an accessory to all those crimes. So holding it on account so that you don't have to deal with me being like, we don't want any part of your problem is a really solid strategy because we don't want to be an accessory to any crime. And we don't want to be complicit and we don't want, I mean, you know, everybody that has a retail Bitcoin business, we don't need to make 0.5% on your ransom. We need to keep our bank account. So, yeah. there, there's a saying in a lot of the Bitcoin circles out there in crypto groups that is always talk about Bitcoin, but never talk about your Bitcoin. That's <laughs> probably a good place to start when it comes to things like that. Um, that, that is actually a discussion that, that most companies are having. Again, n no one discloses that they have Bitcoin just for, for ransomware, and, but yeah, that definitely is a use case that where companies are proactively purchasing Bitcoin, um, not to say that it's the best medium for, for you know, paying ransomware, because again, it's, it's trackable, you have, you know, you can do different things to, to skew that, but yeah, that, that's, that's a discussion that's happening and a lot of companies are buying into that for sure. I'm, I'm going to say one more thing too, like, if you feel you've been the victim of ransomware, like, have someone competent and credible look at what's actually happening to you. Because it, it could be as simple as a small spyware on, like my dad's laptop got hacked and I fixed it in five minutes and he was like, we need to pay them with Bitcoin. So like, I, I think it's really important to just like investigate that a little bit too before you pay, but I've talked twice on this question. So next question. Also, we only have like three minutes, so make them good questions, you guys. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the discussion, guys. Um, so my question is on uh, specifically about Bitcoin on balance sheets, and there's been a lot of discussion about sort of the opportunities and advantages of having Bitcoin on your balance sheet, but also some of the challenges. Uh, I'd like to get the hear some of your opinions on some of the challenges. For example, um, Secretary Yellen recently has made it very clear that you know the SWIFT network and the U.S. dollars, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a instrumental tool in ensuring um, compliance with certain geopolitical issues, for example, Russia and in Ukraine right now, for example. Um, and, you know, more companies putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet sort of challenges Treasury's ability to do that. So, you know, I'd like to get sort of 
possibly the panel's opinion on what, like, what are those some of those legal, maybe regulatory, or just challenges in general on sort of that macro level of the more it happens, the more likely there'll be some pushback from um, government players or actors. Yeah, there, there could be some pushback at some point. Um, the longer it goes, the harder it is for them to push back. And I think that um, the cat's out of the bag. Like, you know, you, you can't ban Bitcoin at this point. You can't meaningfully crack down on Bitcoin. And if they ever try to do that, like there, there's an outside chance that at some point there'll be something like what they did with gold in the 20s where they said it's illegal to personally hold gold or corporately hold gold. Um, they're going to have a much harder time doing that. But if you've got your Bitcoin in self-custody, it's going to be a lot safer than if it's with a large institution. And, uh, you know, in that case, there isn't really much that uh, a regulatory regime can do to you other than try to, to tax you more. But uh, I think we're in a situation where now that it exists, uh, every country in the world, every jurisdiction in the world has to look at how they compare it to every other jurisdiction in the world in the way that they treat Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is money. And you know, a country that bans money is not going to compete very well on the world stage. Yeah, I, I would say you know, some of the challenges um, for, for holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet, again, AML is, was certainly a, a challenge. But you have some very smart people, even in this room, that are able to tackle those challenges for companies that are helping you get Bitcoin on the balance sheet, right? So you're relying on AML programs that are specifically designed for Bitcoin, um, similar to how you have sanctioned, you know, PEP or politically exposed persons and, and sanctioned folks within within the TradFi world. You have those sanctioned wallet addresses. You have those illicit wallet addresses that are able to identify any illicit addresses and, and make sure that you don't transact with those. So. I think one challenge that, that exists still today is on the accounting side. Um, again, I'm not an accountant by trade, but on the accounting side, there still needs to be more clarity in terms of how to account for a lot of these assets, especially if you're putting your Bitcoin to use um, or, or if you're putting your Ethereum to use. So um, yeah, I think accounting is, is one of the major challenges that, that still needs a lot, little bit more clarity. AML, I believe, has, has been addressed to a large extent. You don't want a piece of that, Alex? If I get involved in that, I could talk about this for hours. I, lo I, I love the political landscape and how all this stuff works with this right now. And I'm actually quite opinionated on some of it. So I'll, I'll just leave it alone. But I, it's a very good question. I'd love to talk to you about it more after the show. If you'd like to come find me. I'd... And I, I feel like we're going to get played off stage really quickly. But I will say that I can far more readily access SWIFT from an offshore or banking as a service provider than I can buy Bitcoin in Canada in terms of identification provided and so on. And when institutions are buying Bitcoin and we have the travel rule coming out and we have everybody complying, I mean, Bitcoin companies are more compliant with the PCML TFA than foreign exchange operators, remittance operators, whatever, because we have to be. So to your point, I do feel like AML is really strongly addressed. And also like if I get a subpoena, I can see where all the coins go. I can't see where the bank wire goes. I can see one hop on the bank wire. So I just, my final thought is that nearly every Bitcoin fraud case I see involves SWIFT, but not every Bitcoin transaction involves SWIFT. So I've said at other conferences, like, why don't we ban SWIFT? All right. <laughs> we, we love your banks. <laughs> also, I love my banks, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that excellent panel discussion. That was uh, Ryan Mueller, and we heard from Dave Bradley, Alex uh, CJ? CJ, I'll remember that for next time.